Welcome to ESPN. We have your hosts. We are live here at EOJ. I am Kevin Neekin alongside Joe Friedel. We are here for the kickoff for the game, and I want to tell you it is a good one. The sun has come out. I want to tell you Jesus has risen. He is alive. Actually, we should have Darius in here and do that one day. Hallelujah. Welcome to Eyes on Jesus. A uh, little impromptu uh, video testimony. Um, I was summoned by my wife to ask some questions. Um, sweet Joe didn't know what he was getting into either. So this is what you would call less than scripted um, true reality TV. You know, Joe, it's um, I'm really excited about what the Lord's doing in your life, and I think it's really interesting that he sent you um, to our church. And, and, you know, our church has been praying for you for a long time, even before we ever met you. And I'm so thankful because, you know, only God can do what he's done in your life. And so, you know, I'd love to hear just like, you know, maybe maybe quick little responses as, as, as I've got a whole bunch of questions I'm going to throw at you. But one of the things, like, what was your... I mean, obviously, Brian lived with you, and so you, you've heard, and your parents are believers, and so you've heard, you've heard the gospel for the most part. You grew up, for the most part, a church kid until you decided not to be a church kid. And, you know, what was your first thought like when you walked into that house with a bunch of crazy people watching a video of a guy from Africa? <laughs> well, yeah, so um, I guess I just, I didn't anticipate at all what I was walking into. Um, I mean, I grew up in Catholic church, so I never really experienced the presence of the Lord till I started going to like a non-denominational church. And it was like here and there that I experienced the presence of the Lord. I'd been around somewhat bits and pieces of people who you'd consider to be charismatic, you know, speaking tongues and whatnot. But I had no idea that having a relationship with Jesus Christ was supposed to be an intimate ongoing and continually growing thing um and when i walked into the house um where we had church before it was a house church when i came on november 15th of 2019 i had no idea <laughs> what i was walking into i was just at a point of surrender because i had tried all different routes i'd been to rehab 13 times i'd been to psych ward mental hospital been in a coma six suicide attempts on every psych med you could think of to try and cope and basically deal with, you know, just deal with what I was living with, bipolar disorder, panic attacks, anxiety. And I was at the point of despair and hopelessness, which was actually mercy from the Lord. Um, I was at the end of my rope. So I walked into the house, and the atmosphere was nothing I'd ever experienced before. Um, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, Everybody was so full of joy, so full of life. So there was Everyone seemed so connected, too. There was just so much love. Like, there was just, you could feel tangibly, feel the love and the peace there. And I was, I was confused. I didn't really know what was going on. I didn't know why people were laughing when no one was telling a joke. I didn't know why everybody had so much life. I was like, why are people so happy? What are they, what are they so happy about? Why is there so much joy? And that night that I came, the Lord had already been ministering to me, and I didn't even know it was him, but had been ministering to me that week about unforgiveness that I had held in my heart against someone who bullied me in high school. Um, and the story behind that was I messaged him on Facebook. I told him what I was going through, and he told me to lay it on the foot of the cross. Someone I went to school with who was a Jewish but really an atheist um, back in high school, and he told me, so I guess since then he had converted <laughs> and become a Christian, a believer, and he told me to lay it on the foot of the cross and leave it there, and I was blown away. I was like, th did I message the right person? Like, who, <laughs> who, <laughs> so I had to check it, and I was like, this is crazy, but what it did was the Lord began to soften my heart, because before that, it wasn't a chance I was going to forgive him. I mean, dealing with torment from the enemy based on holding that unforgiveness in my heart. I mean, could not even express the, the torment and the anger and the rage that I felt towards him. Um, there was like a little open door. There was, the, the Lord began to soften my heart. It was, it, was a, it was a miracle. That in itself was a miracle. 
the softening of my heart been so hardened and full of hate and evil for so long well i think one thing that's interesting that you said is that you kind of had tried everything else and i think i think most people it takes getting to the end of your rope in order to actually look to jesus i mean you don't read about people in the bible that for the most part chose jesus when they had anything going for them and i think that's one of the biggest tricks of the devil is that he gets you busy he gets you um, to a place of even feeling hope. Like I think about how many times people are in such desperate need financially and they get a job. And once they get that job, they move right back to they move right back to the the dry, exhausted kind of menial relationship that, that they had before with Christ because they no longer have that need. And so I love that, you know, I, I don't love all you had to go through. I hate I hate all you had to go through. But at the same point, I love that you got to ground zero in order to actually be able to look up and find Jesus. And so I think, so you walk into a house of people, crazy people, and and we're pretty crazy, I get it. Lots of joy, lots of peace. Did you feel instantly like, and, and maybe not instantly is the word, but as you watched the testimony of, of, of Prophet T. B. Joshua and what went on at his church, did you feel like a um, like like weights fell off? Did you feel like like what like what actually happened? Because I know you repented of a lot of things, and I know that the Lord delivered you of several things, and that was beautiful. But like what like what took place while you were sitting on that floor? Like I couldn't believe you got up and came forward, which was very shocking. But I was so thankful when you did. Yeah, and that's it's crazy you ask me this now because I I felt led to actually watch the service the other night, uh, like three or four nights ago, and rewatch it and just see that and and I I'm recalling back to that night and I I was so broken, I was at such a place of brokenness and hopelessness that when I watched that video and this man forgave a man who killed his father, and he reconciled and forgave him, and. I, I believe that T.B. Joshua, when he reconciled him, he used the parable of Matthew 18 of the unforgiving debtor saying that, you know, the master forgave the man of a debt he could never repay and in store, like, basically it's, it, it's, it's giving a parable showing that Christ paid a debt so great that we could never pay, repay that the debts of the trespasses and the sins against us and the harm against us, there's no excuse for us not to, you know, forgive that person. So I'm sitting here watching this man and the Lord just ministered to me through the video, and I just, like, felt like there's no, there's no excuse. Like, this man reconciled with a man who literally killed his, his own father, murdered him on national TV. I mean, just what he did was horrific. It was terrible. It wasn't obviously right by any means, but because of the, the great debt that Christ paid, you know, and forgave him of. He was able to, and, and I felt what it was is like you talk about uh, like getting out of bondage is that the Lord will open the door, but we have to step out. So the Lord opened up the door. He gave me the grace to give, you know, that unforgiveness and bitterness, but I had to make a step. I had to choose to get up there and, and decide I want to give this unforgiveness away. I want to repent. I want to turn to Jesus, and it was, a, it was surrender. It was surrendering it to him. And that's the only part I played in it, was giving up after trying to do everything, was surrendering it to him and saying, Lord, I can't do this. I've been trying to, I've been harboring this unforgiveness my, my entire life, my, many of my older, you know, high school years and out of high school, and I'm just done. So what it looked like in my heart was I, I felt it was truly divine, and, and it was the Lord's grace but he opened the door, and, and it was like, you know, talk, Shine talks about being invited into rest with the hand. His, his hand was out, and it was saying, come to me. And the first thing I had to give to him was unforgiveness. And that allowed, I, I can't even explain, you know, the softening in my heart that came from that. But I just believe, you know, the Lord orchestrated it perfectly because first was the unforgiveness, the night before was some repentance, and then was followed that. After I, uh, you know, did that, I felt led to confess my sins in front of you guys. And, like, I didn't, I didn't know the Bible. That was the Holy Spirit speaking because I didn't know. And you guys all said, 
well, the word of God says in James, you know, 517, that we confess our sins to one another and we may be healed. And I was like, I didn't know that. But he 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 began to, to minister and work through me to confess to you guys and then give my life to Jesus Christ. And then you guys asked if you could anoint me with oil and pray deliverance. And it was the most bizarre thing that's ever happened to me in my life. I mean, I've had a lot of beautiful encounters with the Lord, but to have a desire to drink and use nonstop obsessively for a majority of my teenage years, nonstop panic attacks and debilitating anxiety and fear, never a moment of peace or rest. And just to, when the Lord, you know, obviously operating through you, the Holy Spirit delivered me from a spirit of addiction, spirit of suicide, spirit of death, spirit of fear, and feeling peace. And I almost felt, I think I described it as like a numbness, it's like I felt completely calm and still and peace and at rest. And I said, I haven't felt like this since as long as I could remember. And and I sat there for 10 minutes. And I said, I've been searching through my head for the past 10 minutes. And as long as I remember it, I've always wanted to drink or use. I had this desire, but I can't find it anywhere. And like you guys are jumping up and down cheering. And I'm not fully knowing what's going on. But what was happening was the oppression of the devil was had been broken. By Jesus Christ, it wasn't a 12-step program. It wasn't any recovery. It wasn't any other. It was Jesus Christ. It was the Holy Spirit. It was the gospel that set me free. <laughs> and there's no other way. <laughs> I think it's interesting because weren't you preparing to go to a some sort of a rehab facility in the near future, right? And I remember, so <laughs> we we meet Joe, and Joe gets free, and... Um, he starts coming around like all the time, except on New Year's, to which I called him out on, which was really funny. But Joe starts coming around and he's telling me about this place he's about to go. And I, I'm very, I'm a very simple-minded. I should be like a little hick from West Virginia. I don't know. I, I'm very simple-minded, and so I'm confused because Joe's like, I have zero desire. I, I have not had a drink, and I have zero desire to drink. Can't even find it. And he's like, but I, I'm getting ready to go to this place. I'm like, why the heck are you going to that place for? And I probably said it just like that, because not because I thought he was stupid, because I was really confused. But I want to say that w one thing that's interesting is Joe's 22, 23. 23 years old. He said that he's been addicted to alcohol since you were what? 16, 16 years old. Suicide. Tried suicide. He did heroin. He's done everything that you can think of. That's not good. Right. <laughs> Literally, almost everything that you can think of that's not good. And, you know, there was a lot of opportunity for Joe to step in and try to work his way out of it, and he probably had. And I just love that you got to the end of your rope. I say all that to say, if you're walking through addiction, if you're walking through, uh, if you're walking through suicidal feelings, if you, if you struggle with depression or fear, I want to tell you something. Jesus doesn't partially remove those things. Jesus doesn't show up and say, let me get rid of 17% of those sui suicidal thoughts so that you can be better for the rest. When Jesus shows up, he takes all of it. And when I say shows up, he did it on the cross. And I love that because Joe, what he said was right. All he had to do was surrender. And I want to tell you right now, if you're watching this and you have no clue what's going on, open your Bible. The, the, the Bible is very clear that if we want to follow Jesus, we must deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. And all Joe did was receive the free gift of salvation. And he got delivered of, of spirits that were oppressing him. The Bible says that he didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So if you're dealing with anything that is not of God, I want to tell you, you don't have to deal with it. Now, if you're sick in your body, it doesn't mean you're going to be healed instantly. But we believe he paid for that as well. And so one of my favorite things that, that has happened to Joe over the last what year and a half, I guess, or year and some months, is that he has continued to grow. Like, he didn't, he hasn't plateaued or, or dropped off. But that's the next thing I want to ask you about. So, you know, as, you, as you're talking now and you're testifying, you got saved, you got set free. That's beautiful. You had to rearrange relationships in your life, just part of life. Um, what's been maybe the hardest thing to hold on to or maybe the biggest, I don't want to say hurdle, but what's one of the, what's one of the things that has plagued you in your early walk that is that's probably taken 
his peace out of your life or, or, or caused you to kind of take your eyes off him, even if it's for a moment? Like, is there, is there something that you've had to watch out for, really stand against? Yeah, pride and self-righteousness. Um, pride and self-righteousness. Um, man, I <laughs> it has been by the Lord's grace and his alone and continuing to surrender and realize and deny myself and realize that I can't do it. Earlier today, I was completely wrecked. Just him showing me. It's his mercy and his goodness, but just wrecked, showing me that I can do nothing apart from him. Um, but that self-righteousness and it, generational curse, whatever, it, it tried to come, I mean, it, it always tries to come back, but it disguises itself it, with, like, good intentions, like trying to fulfill the law. Or, or trying to keep, which Christ already paid for by breaking the curse of the law on the cross and set us free from that, you know. And, and, and it's by the law of his spirit. <laughs> so um, self-righteousness and pride, and it disguises itself. You know, the way that the devil comes is, is extremely, he's extremely cunning. And we hate to give him any credit, but he's a lot smarter than we are. And if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit and the word of God, and good covering, and, and I, I mean, if it wasn't by the grace of God alone, like, I, I, would, I would be taken out. So I would, say, I would say pride, and, like, also, I mean, oh, man. I would just say distractions, too, you know, even if they seem like good things. I, I, I think about the... The Lord had me turn to Luke 12 and 13 so many times, and, and I realized why he was doing that. The Lord revealed that, you know, the, the things that the people didn't go to the feast and accept the invitation for were not bad things at all. They were actually things that the Lord provided to them, but they took precedent to their intimacy with Jesus and the Lord. They, you know, they were oxen given to them. It was a wife even. And they said, oh, I'm sorry, I can't go to the feast. I have a wife at home. And the Lord has really just been convicting me about that. Is like, what in my life takes precedent? Is it, is it all me, or y you know? Mm -hmm. Or is it these other things with me? Or is it me and these things? Because the cost of discipleship is, l is, our, is laying down our life. That is the cost. That is the real cost. And it's, it's really gain. It's all gain because we're losing life here that 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 doesn't even it doesn't even mean anything. It's not worth anything at the end of the day. I, I've I, I, those two script two scriptures that have been just wrecking me over and over is is whom do I have in heaven but you and and that his word stands firm in heaven forever and thinking that at the end of the day and by the end of the day, I mean, really, at the end of the day, Christ is is all in all. He stands and, and he he lasts forever. And the things here that we touch, these material things, man, I'm so grateful that I put my hands on and I used and tried to satisfy my flesh with, you know, all these the pride of possessions, lust of the flesh. I am so grateful that the Lord allowed me to go through that and to try everything that I thought would fulfill or satisfy to show me that it left me empty. Because we were born with this longing to be loved, this longing to be accepted. And I was asking someone this at my job, and I said, why do you think it is that every human being has a longing to feel accepted, to be loved? I said, it's because God put that in every man's heart, and it's because Christ is the only one that can fill that. And I'm so grateful that he allowed me to use every drug under the sun and, and, and try to fulfill it in every way I thought I could, ultimately to find out that there was no other way than to come to him. And and like I said, you know, <laughs> I have tried everything, and there's nothing like being filled with the Holy Spirit. There's nothing like the presence of God. Don't feel like you have to try every drug. Be cool. Stay in school. Yeah, disclaimer. <laughs> Well, that's beautiful. I love, you know, a testimony is is a work in progress for the rest of our lives. And, you know, none of us have arrived and none of us will arrive until we actually arrive, you know, with Jesus. And so 
Thank you, Joe, for sharing that. You know, once again, if you have not given your life to Jesus, if you are trying to make things work, I want to save you some time. Joe's trying to save you some time. There is nothing that will satisfy the God-shaped void in your life other than God. And it may seem boring from the outside, but I want to tell you that loving Jesus is the least boring thing you can do. If you're struggling with anything, if you're struggling with anything that's got a hold on you, I want to tell you there's a greater way. There is the only one. His name is Jesus who came. He paid the price on the cross, but he didn't just die. He died and he rose again and he rose again so that when he ascended on high, you could have his spirit living in you. And that same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and actually orchestrates things in, in your life if you'll allow them. So if you don't have a Bible, get one. It is your lifeline. It is your lifeblood. It is the only thing that matters. And if somebody says that's crazy, that doesn't matter, they don't know what they're talking about. Find out for yourself. Don't take somebody's word for it. Take God's word and find out. The Bible says to test it, prove it. As it relates to giving and money, that's all that is is a biblical principle. In the same way, watch God do what he does. Let him prove his worth to you. So, Lord, we just thank you for all those that are, that are watching. I pray, Lord, that that they don't fall so deep in love with Joe's testimony that, that they miss the whole point is Jesus. It's not this church. It's not me or my wife. It is it is Jesus. It has everything to do with Jesus. Jesus Jesus saved Joe. He set Joe free, and now he is leading Joe's life. And I want to tell you, God, thank you for the way that you've done that. If there is anybody that is watching that doesn't know you, I pray that they would have the eyes to see and the ears to hear in the Spirit what you are saying to them, what you want to break off of them, and, Lord, that they are loved. Be glorified by everything said and done in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I just never felt like I could be forgiven for that, what I did, because it just felt like I got to the lowest point in my life. I just felt like I was not going to be able to help me forgive myself. I've been in church for a long time. I've been in the Bible since I was about 14, 15. I went down the road of just being completely blinded and disconnected. And it's the darkest time I've ever had in my life. I struggled with alcoholism. I'm done with it.
for the past 10 minutes and I really can't 